right. Welcome everybody to this exciting session of ACS Science Talks. Uh, I am Asha James, uh, your host for the day. And on behalf of ACS India team, uh, once again, a warm welcome to this ACS Science Talk by Dr. Shana Stola. Uh, just to give you a brief update, please uh, visit our ACS India webpage. The link is dropped in the chat soon. Uh, to keep yourself uh, updated about the upcoming sessions in the ACS Science Talk series, and also for information on how to register for these sessions. We have also posted uh, the past lectures recording in the ACS Science Talks virtual library. Please feel free to go through these and also share amongst your peers and colleagues. We also have the ACS Insights India newsletter. This is a monthly newsletter to keep you updated with cutting edge research published at ACS journals, uh, events or programs from ACS India, as well as products and services. Please subscribe today using the QR code and enjoy reading. We'll also try to post the link in the chat box a little later. Now let's start get started with the scientific session. It's an honor and privilege to have uh, Professor Shana Stula with us. Uh, Professor Stula leads the Laboratory of Toxicology in the Department of Health Sciences and Technology at ETH Zurich, Switzerland. After her BS in Chemistry from the University of California at, California at Berkeley, uh, Professor Stula joined MIT for her PhD in Organic Chemistry. Following this, uh, she had a postdoctoral stay at the University of Minnesota Cancer Center. Professor Stula started her independent research in 2004 as an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Later on, she joined ETH Zurich. Her research interest is at the interface of chemistry and biology, mainly aimed at understanding the chemical basis of mutagenesis and toxicity. Her work is focused on deciphering relationships between chemical structures, biochemical transformations to environment and dietary toxicants and cancer drugs. Professor Stula is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the ACS Chemical Research and Toxicology Young Investigator Award, American Association for Cancer Research Minority Scholar in Cancer Research Award, American Cancer Society Bowman Cancer Research Fellowship. She's also the president of the Swiss Society of Toxicology and served as chair of the ACS Division of Chemical Toxicology from 2019 to 2020. She is currently the editor in chief of the ACS journal, Chemical Research in Toxicology. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Stula uh, to deliver her talk. Over to you, Dr. Stula. Okay, super. Thank you, Asha, for this really nice introduction. And I wanna thank the whole team for, for arranging this wonderful opportunity to reach so many people. And um, I'm happy to join you online from the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And I am originally from the United States, but I must say, I really love being in Switzerland. I'm a big outdoors person, so I appreciate the amazing Alps and snowy mountains and um, small villages. And here's a view from above the mountains and lakes. And here's a shot from the highest elevation footbridge in Europe. And down here, you can see the Alps in the distance directly from the city of Zurich, where I am right now. And I, we are situated here on the Lake of Zurich. Actually, I even took this photo right after giving a lecture in an ETH classroom. And um, so without a doubt, I am not the only one who loves Switzerland. Um, many people in the world do. And I am coming to you to Switzerland, courtesy of the American Chemical Society. And you shouldn't be fooled by the name. The American Chemical Society journals are really truly international. I've been the editor in chief of chemical research and toxicology for the past four years. And when I came on board in 2018, our goal was to really build on the strong foundation and the history of the journal at the interface of chemistry and toxicology and expand the journal scope to include diverse areas in, in the growing field. So as a top journal publishing at the intersection of chemistry and toxicology, we publish monthly issues 
that focus on science that informs a, a chemical and molecular understanding of biological outcomes on the basis of chemical structures and processes. So this is really a key aspect of um, papers that are published in the journal. And this strong chemical and molecular perspective is important for generating a level of understanding that's needed for predicting biological effects. We publish various manuscripts manuscript types, uh, mainly regular research articles. We also have comprehensive reviews. And amongst the different special manuscript types you see here, we recently started the TalkSwatch article. And the figure you see here on the left is from a TalkSwatch concerning the safety of mRNA vaccines. And the TalkSwatch articles are super short reviews that have a single eye-catching graphic like the one here that calls attention to current issues in society that really depend on knowledge from toxicology or covers other emerging, emerging trends in the field. Um, we encourage high quality submissions from a wide breadth of topics in toxicology that um, that are approached uh, by these central concepts. So as mentioned, the breadth of the journal has increased in the past few years, and we're active in publishing special issues and collections to promote some of these new areas. And so I have some um, examples highlighted here, such as epigenetics, medici medicinal chemistry. Um, this is really focusing on drug metabolism, drug safety, and new approaches. We had nano safety, environmental toxicology, computational, and neurotoxicology as recent special issues. We are currently accepting submissions for a collection on natural products in redox toxicology. Um, this can cover, for example, therapeutic or toxic natural products with pro or antioxidative capacity. Um, next year will be the 35th anniversary of the journal, and we will publish a special issue in honor of our founding editor, who's Larry Marnett. He's a pioneer in chemical toxicology, who's a professor at Vanderbilt University. And we have also been working on a review compendium that relates environmental exposures with human disease via a mechanistic understanding of disease etiology and biomarkers. So if you have any interest in submitting to the open special issues, you are encouraged to contact the editorial office at um, the email address here on the bottom. And what I would like to do next is to share a little bit of more detailed insight on the scope of the journal. So here on the right is another TalkSwatch illustration. And this one addresses the role and strategies for toxicokinetics in risk evaluation. So this links um, qualitative aspects like determining um, basically the identification of chemical metabolites and quantitative aspects like determining um, reaction rates and building kinetic models and determining plasma or tissue levels of chemicals and their metabolites, which is a critical aspect of, of risk assessment, especially um, modern risk assessment that really builds on mechanistic understandings and tries to work toward using new approach methods that avoids the use of experimental animals or, or reduces it. So um, the journal publishes studies that concern how agents alter the normal function or structure of biological systems. And the agents can be really diverse. So ranging from physical, chemical, or biological agents, as well as materials. And the responses range from the biomolecular level to cellular to organism level. And the studies published in the journal also elucidate mechanisms of adverse as well as therapeutic responses to agents and encompass the development of predictive models of biological functions and networks. Um, and along these lines, we, we have studies that concern high content characterization of molecular responses. So examples like metabolomics or proteomics studies. And um, this includes the development and application of such cutting edge bioanalytical approaches. Um, strategies like mass spectrometry are highly important to some of the work promoted in the journal. And we are interested in findings about potentially hazardous agents, as well as novel methodologies to characterize their levels or to evaluate biological responses. And finally, these are not limited to exogenous agents, but 
Um, some of the studies also have to do with the understanding the basis of disease etiology. So looking also at endogenous as well as exogenous agents and the molecular pathways or, or networks that are important for um, really understanding disease mechanisms. So a key model for how chemicals give rise to adverse responses involves the generation of reactive metabolites from metabolic conversion. And this process often involves a two-step or a, a two-phase process whereby reactive metabolites are generated, such as by activation with cytochrome P450s, which are important for the bioconversion and function of many drugs, as well as um, giving rise to the toxic, to the effects of different toxic chemicals. So the reactivity of both the original xenobiotic compound or the reactive metabolite can interact with biomolecules and give rise to adverse effects. There's also a second phase of metabolism that's often important for the conjugation of the reactive metabolites with structures, uh, say, such as glucuronides that are well care that are that are well recognized and physiologically excreted, um, thus avoiding adverse effects. And a prominent physiological location of these transformations is in the liver, where we have a high expression of metabolic enzymes. Um, but it, in addition uh, to these metabolic enzymes and their catalysis of chemical transformation, the human gut microbiota has um, emerged, especially for compounds that are secreted in the colon, as a basis for catalyzing the formation of other reactive metabolites and can also deconjugate uh, conjugated metabolites that really can drive enterohepatic circulation of chemicals and impact the balance between the physiological retention and excretion of toxic chemicals. So if you have signed up for this talk, um, either one, you were excited to see some pictures of Switzerland, or two, you have appreciated that um, the human gut microbiome has emerged as a really critical player in human health and disease. So there are trillions of microbial cells in the human body and microbiomes are comprised of 150 times more genes than the human genome. And these genes are um, encoding a lot of functional enzymes and the composition of the human gut microbiome is uh, linked with risks, for example, of cancer, metabolic syndrome, um, influences on the gut-brain axis, um, a driver of gut-brain integrity, and a host of immune modulation responses. And so a major basis of the biological effects um, can be um, potentially related to the metabolic capacity of gut microbiota. And so, um, so meanwhile, I, I mentioned at the beginning when I really transitioned from talking about the, the journal to, to talking about our research topic, that a central aspect of chemical toxicology is understanding how chemicals are converted into new forms and then understanding how that influences their biological effects. And so we know microbes can transform xenobiotic chemicals by a wide range of chemical reactions. So some examples are shown here along with the relevant types of enzymes. So this includes hydrolysis reactions, uh, deglycosylation reactions. We have uh, reduction reactions, transfer reactions such as um, acetyl groups and methyl groups, reactions that generate radicals. And then uh, um, this dehydration reaction um, shown here whereby glycerol is um, converted, for example, into, um, into three HPA. So this uh, aldehyde shown here. And um, for the main example that I'm gonna present now, I'm gonna focus in, in a little bit more detail on, on this last uh, dehydrogase reaction that is shown here. And this de dehydration reaction uh, shown a little bit more here is the basis of the formation of three hydroxy propanol. And the 3 hydroxypropanol is um, can be formed in the gut and it's actually unstable and it can exist in its hydrated form, it can exist in a dimerized form. And this has been known for a long time as the ruterin system. And it's been known that uh, bacteria can produce ruterin and that bacteria can secrete 
on ruterin. The ruterin has antimicrobial effects and the capacity for microbes to excrete ruterin can really shape the biological environment or the niche that these microbes are making for themselves in a complex microbial community. So we recently discovered that an important basis for these effects and really an obligate component of the system is the thermal decomposition of 3-HPA to form acrolein. And acrolein is a toxic reactive metabolite that can react with proteins, nucleic acids, and, and redox buffering components of the cell like glutathione. And this can um, give rise to um, give rise to toxicity. And so one of the things that um, we have observed is that heterocyclic amines, such as this compound FIP and methyl IQX, in the presence of these ruterin producing bacteria can be converted to um, conjugated uh, metabolites. So this FIP-M1 and this methyl IQX type metabolites actually form from a Michael type addition of acrolein to the starting heterocyclic amines. So these heterocyclic amines are chemicals that are produced in meats that are cooked at high temperatures. They are chemical carcinogens that um, damage DNA and can give rise to mutations. And their presence in cooked meat is hypothesized to be a basis for a relationship between high meat consumption and colorectal cancer risk. So when ingested, heterocyclic amines are absorbed and converted in the liver to glucuronide conjugates. And in this form, they can be secreted into the colon. So another key class of microbial enzymes that control the disposition of chemicals in the colon are beta-glucuronidases, and the beta-glucuronidases can hydrolyze the, the glucuronides back to the starting heterocyclic amines. And they can then, uh, the free heterocyclic amines can go on to react with acrolein. Okay, so, um, so basically um, we, we established that acrolein is an inherent component of the ruterin system, number one that um, heterocyclic amines are converted to acrolein conjugates. And number, number three, that, that glucuronides are viable substrates for this conversion. Um, by the way, I, um, we found that this could be catalyzed by co-cultures of bacteria that harbor each the beta-glucuronidase and glycerol dehydratase, or by single enzymes that have actually both functions. And we also found that complex microbial communities catalyze this reaction to varying extent, um, but I'll, I'll get to that part about the complex uh, microbial communities a little later. So um, a first question we asked once we had an understanding of the um, the, the chemical mechanism of, of this process is what is the toxicological relevance of this novel conjugation reaction? So using in vitro assays, we were able to show that the conjugation reaction leads to a reduction in mutagenicity and a reduction in cytotoxicity of these compounds. And th this observation really made sense based on our knowledge of the chemical basis of HCA um, mutagenicity, because the, um, the exocyclic amino group is is usually activated in the um, hepatic activation process that gives rise to reactive intermediates that can <clears throat> damage DNA and cause mutations. And so it made sense to us that this kind of um, conjugation reaction could be a detoxification reaction. And we were also curious about how the conjugation could influence the absorption of the compound. So for example, whether the conjugation might sequester or promote the uptake or alter the background enterohepatic circulation um, of the molecule. <clears throat> so using an intestinal, using um, a model where we um, use segments of, um, of rodent intestines and a um, quantitative mass spec assay to, to measure um, levels of the compounds in the mucosal versus serosal compartment of, of this model. We can see that the uptake of the molecules, the, the passage through the intestinal membrane was relatively low, um, but that it was pretty similar for both of the molecules. So we didn't see a big increase or 
or decrease. Um, but we could compare, we could combine basically these data with, um, um, with other metabolic parameters and we can build a physiologically based toxicokinetic model that describes the impact of microbial transformation on the disposition and the clearance of one of these compounds. So we did this um, for methyl IQX in humans. And um, furthermore, we could rely on data that was previously published about the excretion of methyl IQX by individual sub subjects who were eating meals that contain the chemicals. And what we did was modeled the influence of how the microbial transformation could affect the total plasma levels of methyl IQX in each of these individuals. And you see here how they're expected to decrease the presence um, the, the levels of the carcinogen are expected to decrease in the presence of acrolein. And, and this, of course, varies between different individuals. Okay, so um, speaking of different individuals, um, we wanted to relate our, our findings to the complexity of microbial communities in the human gut. And so um, we examined the total uh, GDH abundance. So this is the gene that's in encoding the dehydratase. And um, we did this using metagenome data from groups of adults who were either healthy or had, who had colorectal cancer. And um, we found a variance by at least two orders of magnitude in, in both groups of donors. But um, when we looked on the level of the different taxa of the microbes that contribute to the GDH, um, we, we see here um, the blue comes from the anaerobutyricum halii, and we see a strong contribution. We see its strong contribution of um, this taxa to GDH abundance, and moreover, there's a slight increase of the A halii in the healthy population versus the colorectal cancer population. So, um, so with this information extracted from this um, of publicly available metagenome data, we could go back in the lab and test different strains with um, different characteristics and, um, and quantify their efficiency by which they could transform the, the conversion of, of FIP to its metabolite. And an exciting observation was that we could actually take complex, different complex microbial mixtures um, and supplement them with these GDH competent strains like A. halii, and, and then we could promote the, um, promote the activity of the conjugation reaction in those samples. So um, the, the data on the last slide was based on this um, available uh, metagenome data, and we wanted to then directly test the capacity of these complex human gut microbiota to produce acrolein and characterize the conversion of FIP. So, so in the last study from the publicly available data, we can, we can make predictions based on the um, metagenome level data, but we, um, we needed to use fresh human fecal samples and ferment these under anaerobic conditions with FIT to, um, to allow us to um, really test their, the capacity to catalyze these reactions. And then what we also did with these samples is we tested the, um, their supplementation with Ahalia and how this changed the, the abundance of, um, or, or let's say the efficiency of that transformation reaction. And so um, what we found is that after um, six hours, the FIP transformation with these um, uh, supplementation experiments, that after six hours, the, the FIP transformation capacity could be increased, increased even amongst the high and low A. halii abundance groups. Um, but um, after longer time, we um, in the high abundance A. halii groups, they, it did not increase that much. And may, maybe that basically makes sense. Once we have um, microbiomes that have a high capacity already, it's, it's harder to promote that reaction, but, but these microbiomes already have that capacity. Okay, so, um, so we identified a microbial process that leads to the conjugation of these HCAs. And it appears to be a detoxification reaction. Um, it seems that healthy, I go back here, healthy individuals 
are better at catalyzing the reaction than colorectal cancer patients. And it can be promoted by this sort of probiotic strategy of supplementing complex mixtures with ahalii. So that sounds great, except for the part that involved the generation of acrolein in the gut. And indeed, um, based on this work, we've suggested that the human gut microbiome is an endogenous basis of acrolein exposure. And we know that acrolein is toxic. So we show here that um, something that is well known, it leads to reduction in cell viability. It can reduce glutathione levels. And this can in turn contribute to an increase in cellular oxidative stress. Acrolein also reacts with DNA forming these DNA addicts. And um, so acrolein is, is genotoxic. And um, these are, there are model studies that are done in vitro, but they suggest the potential for the initiation of mut mutagenicity in host cells, such as those in the intestinal wall, if acrolein is being produced. And finally, acrolein also activates the transcription of certain genes, such as uh, some of those involved in response to oxidative stress and DNA damage, um, DNA damage responses. So these in vitro studies of the effects of acrolein um, are difficult to conduct because of the volatility and obtaining pure samples of acrolein for cellular exposure studies. Um, and so this uh, one slide here is showing a, a nice solution um, that a, a postdoc in the lab had to solve this problem. She devised a clever strategy for generating acrolein in situ for toxicological assays. Um, we can do this because uh, diamine oxidase metabolizes spermine and generates two equivalents of acrolein. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is generated in the process, um, but the, this can be consumed by, uh, um, in the presence of catalase. And so, um, so we have suitable conditions where the cell viability isn't negatively impacted and we can generate um, acrolein and demonstrate that biomolecular addicts arising uh, from it are, are formed in these cells at, at levels that are consistent with where um, we would expect them to be. So we're, we're still left with this open question of what is the impact to the host of the capacity of the microbiome to generate acrolein and the fact that acrolein is is really an obligate component of this Ruterin system. And is this a benefit because of the positive effects with regard to the decontamination of heterocyclic amines? Or is it rather a negative effect because of the generation of acrolein? And basically our hypothesis is that the balance of these effects really depends on exposure dynamics. And this can relate, for example, to how much glycerol there is in the intestine. And so um, glycerol concentrations can depend, for example, on the high fat content of a diet. And, um, and furthermore, there's the potential for a non-threshold behavior of acrolein. So this can mean that high levels of exposures from exogenous sources may be toxic where um, extremely low level endogenous production might stimulate protective mechanisms and actually make it protective. And, um, and so this is, um, this is uh, just an aside on the acrolein and I'm gonna now come back to the overview of um, this short catalog of reactions that are catalyzed by the gut microbiota. And so we can now add here the production of acrolein from glycerol and its reaction with heterocyclic amines. And so um, we, we spent a lot of time on, on what I just shared. There were basically two PhD, hypo, uh, two PhD theses and the input of a lot of postdocs to delineate this interesting story about glycerol dehydratase, acrolein, and heterocyclic amines. And as the awareness of the relevance of gut microbial transformations has grown, there's really various um, nice examples of high throughput strategies for profiling diverse interactions, such as this example um, of Michael Zimmerman that focuses on microbial metabolism of hundreds of drugs by different, um, by different gut uh, 
bacterial gut isolates. So using this, um, using a pooled sample approach, they're able to, um, to screen almost 4,000 samples to monitor drug transformations and identify metabolites. So approaches like this really open the opportunity to define metabolic changes for a suite of reactions in parallel. And so for another study that we have currently underway, we're developing a, um, we've developed a similar mass spectrometry based approach to profiling transformations of several chemical probes. Um, these are mostly drugs and drug-like molecules that are individually selected to give us a representative range of different chemical transformations, such as those shown on the earlier slide um, with the chemical reactions and optimized for stability and analytical responses. So um, traditional bioassays involve the exposure of experimental animals to chemicals. And from this, we can profile uh, alterations in the, micro, uh, the microbial diversity, as well as metabolic changes in the fecal metabolomes and the, the serum metabolomes. And we would like to understand how we can determine the influences of chemical exposures on microbial metabolic capacity um, by, by relaying rather by relating this rather to in vitro studies and reducing the use of experimental animals. And so we wanna get this, this functional information much like, we, much like we did in the example where we use the fresh fecal fermentations from, from human donors to determine the, um, the relative capacity to metabolize FIP. So we are working on extrapolating this in vivo, ex vivo, in vitro metabolism alterations by using a combination of um, metabolic profiling um, assay and um, a, let's see, oh, I don't have it shown here, um, but we're using basically a combination of um, of first a standard in vivo approach where we can then uh, profile the metabolomics, the microbial diversity changes. And this is carried out by our collaborators who are at BASF in Germany. And um, in this study, they have been able to characterize several changes that we see in the metabolomes and in the um, microbial community in response to different exposures to different chemicals such as artificial sweeteners and antibiotics at different doses. And so now we wanna aim to um, get at this microbial functionality question that I was mentioning on the previous slide. And so this is the approach that we are developing um, to do this. So we use a set of these chemical probe molecules that are known to undergo uh, gut microbial transformations. And we carry out fecal fermentations and compare the profiles between the feces from the exposed and unexposed animals to reveal interactions between the, the chemical exposures. So here is an example of some uh, chemical profiling data. So on the left, you see the general stability and some, some background um, spontaneous uh, chemical transformations. And we have an example of data from four um, active microbiota, in this case, uh, from experimental animals. So, um, so if you compare this to uh, the, the cartoon data, um, we're profiling the, the cartoon data where you have uh, individual bars. Um, in the actual data, what we're really doing um, right now is profiling rates. And so we're tracking changes in concentration over time. And so, um, and so you can see the, the reactions that are uh, efficiently catalyzed versus those that um, are poorly catalyzed in the individual microbiota. And each of the depleted probes represents a different type of chemistry that is being catalyzed by these complex microbiota. Okay, so um, to summarize some takeaway conclusions from the research I presented, in the first part, I explained how a particular microbial enzyme, namely glycerol dehydratase, leads to a chemical conjugation of genotoxic dietary heterocyclic amines, and that this transformation appears to be a detoxification process with regards to the genotoxicity of the heterocyclic amines, and elevated levels in human microbiomes may be associated, therefore, with reduced risk of colorectal cancer. Um, on the microbial side, 
we found that supplementing complex gut microbiota with GDH active strains could, could promote and bring about this biotransformation reaction. But um, a glitch in, in this nice concept that we have not overlooked is that these microbes are therefore in, uh, an endogenous source of acrolein. So the overall implications of this exposure are not clear and there might be dietary patterns where this process is actually beneficial and other scenarios where there is an overproduction of a potentially harmful metabolite. And then finally, um, in new directions, we're taking a broader approach to fingerprint the capacity of different chemical exposures to alter the metabolic capacity of the microbiome. And before um, closing on uh, the um, scientific presentation, I will mention another area that this approach closely relates to, um, and that has to do with personalized nutrition. So um, we've just seen a range of functionality and uh, diversity amongst individuals in regards to toxic chemicals. And this also holds true for their personalized impact on beneficial com components of the diet, such as these um, food derived urolithin molecules, and these are formed from natural products in foods like pomegranates, grapes, and walnuts. And the enzymes that mediate these processes have not been identified, but we know that the profiles of um, different urolithin metabolites can be a means to metabotype individuals and determine how proficient they are at forming certain metabolites. And so understanding how these alterations are driven not only by, um, by say individuals from a personalized perspective, but also within certain demographics could help with the selection or design of nutritional products that have an optimal combination with, uh, um, with the beneficial microbial effects of, um, of the microbial metabolism and, and production of active molecules. So I close the um, scientific part, acknowledging the wonderful team who is working on microbial transformations in our lab. Um, we'd been interested for a long time in the metabolic transformations of chemicals, um, mostly by host enzymes. And then now we've come into the area of um, microbial transformations. Um, and this has been stimulated by collaborations with um, biotechnologists, uh, Christophe Lacroix and Clarissa Schwab. And, um, and the early work on the heterocyclic amines, uh, the acrolein metabolite, uh, the uptake toxicokinetic model was the work of Bob Shang, who was a PhD student who is now starting his own lab in the Netherlands. And the um, in vivo, in vitro extrapolation study with the, um, with the um, is a, a collaboration between BASF and, um, and Professor Reitkens in the Netherlands, so Ben van Revensway at BASF, and um, Aish is a, is a student doing her uh, PhD at BASF. So um, also here on the left is Alejandro Ramirez, who just defended his PhD last week, and he's done the experiments with the complex human gut microbial communities and their supplementations. Uh, Georg Eichinger is leading the personalized nutrition project on urolithins. Uh, this is done together with his uh, student Merit. And here on the right is Ali, who is the mass spec whiz behind the novel probe-based profiling methods and its application in diverse contexts. And then in the front here, Katie Hurley is involved somehow in essentially all of the microbiome projects and has developed this in situ acrolein generating system, which is of course relevant for addressing the effects of acrolein in a broad sense, not just related to the microbiome. So here is the entire team in Zurich. Um, working also on other areas of chemical toxicology. Um, we thank these funders of the work that I presented. And here is where you can follow the lab, me, um, as well as the journal on Twitter. And so um, at the very end now, I want to come back uh, briefly to the journal. And the chance to give this talk with such a um, nice, large worldwide audience 
um, including this great chance to connect with many colleagues in India reflects how important a diverse community of chemical toxicologists is to advancing science that has strong relevance for human health and the environment. And um, we think it's uh, important to support a global community in, in chemical toxicology and all of its related interdisciplinary and enabling areas. So I wanted to end by highlighting um, some more information on the journal, journal's work to really engage the scientific community. Um, so let's see. Seem to be something blocking the screen. I think I got have it gone. Um, so uh, I'll give you some examples here. So we have recently published a collection of review articles um, as part of a series called Building Chemical Bonds. And each manuscript includes a dedication to a um, postdoctoral mentor. And we're producing a series of nice interview videos between the mentors and the mentees about strategies and lessons learned from great mentoring. So all of the review articles have been published and the first interviews are posted on ACS Axial. Um, the journal has a diverse group of editors with expertise covering this broadened scope of the journal. And um, we reside in the US, in Europe, and in China. And we have a larger editorial advisory board that is really covering the entire globe. We have members who are in academia, in industry, and in government, and all are well established independent scientists, but at different stages of their career. Um, we like to do activities where we partner with scientific societies. We have a very strong relationship with the ACS Division of Chemical Toxicology. And following ACS um, national meetings, student awardees have, um, have written summaries of scientific sessions that are highlighted as TalksWatch articles, or they have published um, editorial interviews with uh, winners of um, Division of Chemical Toxicology awards. Um, with uh, ACS representatives around the world, we have different in, um, initiatives to advance science and engage the community. And there's actually um, some momentum behind creating a chapter of the ACS Division of Chemical Toxicology um, in India and highlighting contributions um, from India, as well as um, related initiatives with other regions of the world, such as China. And so um, I wanna, um, on the very last slide, I wanted to give a heads up on things that are not even announced. Um, so only, uh, only said here so far. Um, first of all, we will soon post a call for the 2022 CRT Young Investigator Award. Um, this is an award with more than 10 years of history. Um, if you uh, might have caught in the introduction, I was a winner of the award uh, quite uh, a while back when it was new. And it's sponsored by the journal in partnership with the, with the ACS division, chemical toxicology. And the call should come up um, in the coming weeks. And then the nomination deadline will not be long after that. And the award honors a scientist who has had a major impact on research in chemical toxicology or a related field. Um, they should be early in their career, no more than 10 years beyond the PhD. And there is an honorarium and a conference symposium in Chicago next year. It's open to candidates from anywhere in the world and at any type of institution. And secondly, I mentioned already um, activities in the Division of Chemical Toxicology aiming to found a chapter in India, and the journal plans to launch a call for contributions to a special issue. We're still um, working to create the editorial team and define the scope of the scientific connection. So this is really an early mention of this, but we've had a lot of experience um, with issues organized by scientists from around the world um, as highlighted um, with, this, with this cover. And um, so we know this is, will be a fruitful project and we really look forward to um, any inquiries or suggestions at the editorial office. This can be sent to the email that is at the bottom of the slide. Um, so this is all for me. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to share more about chemical toxicology um, and in particular, this emerging role of the microbiome in toxicology, um, the contributions of my lab working in this area at the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you.